to talk about aesthetics and the evolution of code. Um, you can learn all about me and my work at where.corelinecodes, which has to be one of the best vanity URLs ever. <laughs> um, you can find me on the Twitters at CorelineAda. I tweet about feminism, intersectional, intersectional feminism, um, transgender issues, code, and I also exchange puns with my friends. I work for a company called Instructure. We make a learning management system called Canvas, which is an alternative to Blackboard. It's like Blackboard, except it doesn't suck as bad. <laughs> um, we have millions of users, and we focus really hard on the quality of our code. Um, so I do a lot of thinking about code and the context in which we create it and use it, from its inception, through the process of creating it, all the way to refactoring it, um, and the impact that our code has on the community as a whole. Like many of you, much of my day is spent on legacy code. I'm part of a refactoring team that's charged with breaking up our large monolithic application into something smaller and more serviceable. Um, I sort of take offense to the use of the word legacy as a pejorative, because a legacy is something that's handed down from one generation to another generation. If we decide to treat it as a curse, that's our own damn fault. Working with legacy code has given me perspective on code quality and how our pursuit of quality changes the code bases that we work in. I believe that there's a particular way that we judge the quality of code, and that by thinking about how our code will be judged, it can lead us to create better code now. So we're really attached to this term, elegance. Um, it's a very loaded word, and we're captive to the notion of elegance, but it's really a slippery word to define. I'm reminded of a book that I loved as a child and love as an adult, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. At one point, Alice and Humpty Dumpty are having a, an argument about the word glory. And Humpty Dumpty says, when I use a word, it means exactly what I intend it to mean, neither more nor less. It's a question of who's to be master, that's all. So does that mean that elegance is so slippery a word that we can't attach actual meaning to it? Well, it just so happens there's an, an, an entire science devoted to aesthetics and beauty, and that's what I'd like to explore with you today. So we'll talk a little bit about aesthetic theory. Aesthetics is an experiential um, concept. It's the study of how we experience beauty. Normally, aesthetics is considered a sensory appreciation of beauty, but it can also be a cognitive phenomenon. There are four main approaches to aesthetic theory. The first is pluralism, which states that every person perceives things differently and derives different meanings from an experience. Therefore, there's no absolute truth in perception. You can think about this like the expression or the, the statement that when we look at something blue, we all see a different blue. The second approach is hybridism. In hybridism, perception and meaning derive from a rich common representation. The common representation is truthy. We all generally see the same thing when we look at something blue. There's absolutism. Absolutism says that beauty derives from truth and provability. Because of the wavelengths of light at a specific frequency strike our retinas in a particular way, we all see the exact same blue. This is the aesthetic that's most often applied to code. Edgar Dijkstra, who is a um, Dutch mathematician and computer scientist, says that this aesthetic quality is the only one that, appeals, that applies to code because code is directly derived from applied mathematics. We're going to talk about him a little later. And finally, there's eclecticism. Eclecticism promotes the idea of the application of different interpretations contextually rather than adhering to a single set of standards. So we all see blue, but we may interpret it differently. The effects, the effects of our aesthetic sensibilities can also be deliberate. This is called applied aesthetics. We consider a structure. A structure is made of materials for a given utility at a fixed cost. But if this was the only criteria that we used for building structures, we'd live in concrete boxes. So by applying aesthetics, deliberately injecting aesthetic attributes into what we build, buildings can be elevated to new dimensions, not just utilitarian, but an experience of something that is a, a shared experience of beauty. This makes our interactions with the building more pleasing. Both of these buildings serve a function, but one of them has an aesthetic quality that the other lacks. As human beings, we want to be surrounded by beautiful things. This is Bacon's Castle in Virginia, in Surrey County, where I grew up. It's the oldest brick building in Virginia. It was built in 1665. It got its name from a group of soldiers who um, barracked there during uh, Nathan Bacon's, Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. It's been preserved as an historic monument for 350 years by public and private funds. This is a building from Soviet-era 
um, built in a brutalist style. The brutalist style emerged when buildings had to be rapidly rebuilt after World War II to replace the rubble and ruins of burned out cities. I, I seriously doubt that this building is going to be maintained as an historic monument for 350 years. Software is the same way. We don't want to maintain monolithic applications with brutalist architectures. We want to create small, elegant programs that serve a function and that lead to um, have predictable behavior and have an aesthetic quality that we appreciate. Aesthetics and elegant, elegance in aesthetics is um, an experience. It's about conforming to an imprecise set of standards and with no extraneous lines or rough edges. Elegance in code is, is a result of a mysterious set of processes, just like evolution and uh, just like um, elegance in nature is. In the case of nature, the process is largely evolutionary. I want to define our terms here about evolution. So most of you are familiar with the concept. I went to public school in the South, so this was kind of a, a learning lesson for me. <laughs> um, the first concept is the genotype. The genotype is the genetic information about um, an organism. It's the, um, the length of the eye stalk, the height of the stem, the color of the fur. Genotypes are expressed as phenotypes. These are the physical manifestation of genetic characteristics. Natural selection is the process by which traits become more or less prevalent in a population, depending on its um, impact on um, the successful reproduction of, a, of an individual organism. Um, a canonical example of natural selection is the forest moth. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, light-colored forest moths blended in with trees better, so they were less likely to be eaten by predators um, than their dark-complected um, counterparts. But when the Industrial Revolution came along and soot started covering everything in the forest, the darker-colored moths gained an evolutionary advantage, and they began to outnumber their lighter-colored counterparts. There's also artificial selection in which humans directly intervene in the evolutionary process, and that's what we'll talk about next. So can aesthetics be a factor in evolution? I'd like to introduce you to John Chapman, better known as Johnny Appleseed. He lived in the 1700s. He famously wore a shirt made out of a coffee sack. He planted orchards throughout uh, North America for sale to settlers. He would basically find areas where settlement was likely to occur plant an orchard, and when the people actually arrived, he would sell it to them. He traveled everywhere with bushels of apple seeds. Now, it's important to realize that in the 1700s, sweetness was a luxury. Sugar plantations using slave labor were not yet in operation, and honeybees were rare. The only honeybees in North America are those that were brought over by English settlers. So fruit was basically the only source of sweetness for a lot of people, and fruit is short-lived. So today we think of apples like this, like the red delicious. It's very, very pleasing to the eye. It tastes delicious. Um, inside of every apple is a chamber with five to eight seeds. Now, if you take the seeds from a red delicious apple and plant them, you do not get red delicious apple trees. Fruit that is edible um, is the result of grafting branches from one, um, from one variety onto the tree of another variety. So if you plant an apple seed, you're going to get something more like that. And this is the kind of apple that Chapman's orchards produced. So what was he thinking? Um, why would he plant trees that would yield an edible fruit? Because he wasn't interested in the fruit so much as what could be made with the fruit in the form of hard <laughs> cider, which preserved the sweetness and had the added benefit of getting you drunk. So he was actually pretty smart. And these, those orchards he planted were pretty valuable. But in the 1830s, the temperance movement arose, and people started considering alcohol to be a great evil in, in society. So the apple orchards were in danger of losing their value. So apple growers started a propaganda campaign. This is where the expression, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, came from. Um, they, they experimented with new varieties of apple, selecting and crossbreeding apples that had an aesthetic quality that people could um, actually want to eat. Um, so artificial selection came into play. The genetic expression of the apple has changed tremendously over the last 300 years. Um, based, on the, based on the preferences of the people that consume them. Precious boughs were brought from Europe to create fruit trees that produced edible fruit. And there were, um, but cider, per, cider predominated until the 1800s. By the end of the 1800s, there were literally thousands of varieties of apples being cultivated. And today we have about 20 that are standardly available. Whether we guide the changes through crossbreeding 
or inadvertently do the same thing by selecting variations of a phenotype that we find pleasing, we have an effect of the, on the evolution of things in our everyday lives. Is aesthetics an integral part of evolution, or is it an outside influence imposed by humans? This brings up the question of what do genes want? You may have heard of a book called The Selfish Gene, which explores the concept. The idea was first proposed by an American evolutionary biologist named George Williams. He's, he posited that since evolution is about survival of an individual gene, that evolution could be best, be best viewed from the perspective of that gene rather than an organism or a species. One of the interesting things that came out of his research is something called the green beard effect. So imagine a gene that, it, that generates a green beard in male individuals and a, in a, in a uh, pre, pre, in a word, sorry, and a predisposition to treat other green beards with um, respect. So this is an example of where the gene, the gene's expression benefits the gene and the propagation of the gene more than the propagation of the species because green beards can't reproduce. This is a selfish expression of the gene. And in the programming world, we also see the green beard effect. Um, the green beard effect manifests as a tendency to rely on languages that are familiar to us and develop communities around these languages. And it's not just for our own benefit. It actually benefits the language more than it benefits us as individuals. Technology is not playing the same game that we're playing. So we can ask ourselves, what does code want? What does our selfish code want? I think there are three main things. Code wants to be ubiquitous. It wants to be on every device, everywhere in the world, from your phone to your coffee maker. It wants to be universal. Technologies want to be applicable to as many problems as possible. Think of the API paradigm. It survived from RPC to XML RPC to SOAP all the way through to today's use of JSON. The concept of the API is a selfish concept that we are able to utilize to our own benefit. Finally, code wants longevity. Think about Unix. It's the longest lived program in existence probably. And it's um, achieved its longevity by being open and being modular. Those are evolutionary advantages. So how, how does code get what it wants from us? It starts by being flexible. The flexibility of a given technology beyond, it encourages specialization and reduces the cost of staying with one technology over switching to another. By being extensible, meaning the language can be used for novel applications beyond the design of its creators. By being novel, supporting new features and new methodologies that were unknown at the time of its creation that keeps us constantly engaged in a particular technology. And finally, by being entrenched. And this is the notion of the, the, the fallacy of sunk money. If you imagine a poker player who's lost $1,000 at the table in a night, that poker player is likely to keep playing because he has so much money sunk into the game already, it's too expensive to walk away. And in software, it's the same sort of thing. Think about IE6 and intranets. We've been bound to supporting IE6 for years and years and years because that was an entrenched technology. Is it fair to compare evolutionary forces in the natural world to code? And how do the basic principles of evolution map onto technology? As a genotype, we have languages. Languages are, um, define the interactions that we can have with a, with a given code base. They define the, um, the metaphors that are in use, the API that's in use, and basically the capabilities of our ability to express something in that language as an application. See, applications are more or less phenotypes. Code has to perform in um, a very complicated environment. There are platforms to consider. There are OSs. There's the internet at large and all of its competitive forces. And I liken this to natural selection in the natural world. And there's also the deliberate intervention of humans in the, in the evolution of a technology. The functional equivalent of a generation is a cycle of attention for, toward a piece of code, from its inception to its maintenance to its eventual refactoring. So we've seen how aesthetics can influence evolution in nature, in organisms. Can the same thing happen with algorithms? How can we judge the aesthetics of a programming language? There are five main ways that we interact with a programming language through source code, user interface, the command line, its API, and documentation. APIs com comprise the syntax, keywords, methods, and metaphorical design of, an, of a language. 
The command line is the ability to launch programs and to interact with them through an executable environment like console or if you're a Rubyist IRB. Documentation. How accessible is the documentation to developers? How easy is it, is it to understand it, to read it, to parse it, to add to it? There's the readable, readability of the code itself. This is um, a matter of how easy is written code in this language able to be parsed by a human? And the user interface, which governs the way that we interact with the code, whether it's through the command line, through a GUI, or through the internet. I conducted a survey in 2014 across um, each of those categories, API, CLI, documentation, user interface, and readability for six languages and asked people to rate them from very poor to excellent. Um, I'm a fake scientist, so my survey was probably not very scientific, but it yielded some interesting results. I used the data to feed into something I call the aesthetic index. Python came out on top with Ruby in a close second. JavaScript in third place next to C Sharp, and Java and PHP trailing behind. So what does that actually mean? If we cross-reference that with how popular languages are, we see a direct correspondence between aesthetically pleasing languages and their um, decline or in improvement in popularity. JavaScript is an outlier here because there's no viable alternative to client-side scripting. Um, it would probably be further down the line if, there were, if that were not the case. So that's languages. But what about the aesthetic characteristics of code itself, the phenotype in our metaphor? I think there are four basic interconnected aesthetic principles. The first is correctness. And this is sort of falls into the absolute sphere of aesthetic theory. Um, but I don't think a correctness alone is enough to justify the beauty of a piece of code. And I'm going to pick on Edgar Dijkstra a little bit here. He believes that programming is an extension of applied mathematics and that be the beauty of code um, arises from its perfection, from its provability. So a couple of years ago, I found this book called Clever Algorithms, Nature-Inspired Programming Recipes. I was starting to dabble in AI again, so I was very excited about this book. Um, Nature-Inspired Programming Recipes, all in Ruby. It couldn't be more perfect. The only way it could be more perfect is if Douglas Hofstadter delivered it on the back of a giant raven and dropped it right <laughs> in my lap. Where's my slide? There we go. There's Douglas Hofstadter. <laughs> Then I made the mistake of opening the book, and I found methods like this, drand1ben, with the method signature that's 14 arguments long. Yuck. <laughs> this beast of a method goes on for 118 lines, and it's all procedural code in Ruby with no objects in sight. Yuck. And this was written by a PhD. Pretty scary. It's this guy, Jason Brownlee. The only two places where code like this can be considered aesthetically pleasing are in the mind of its creator and in bizarro world. <laughs> the second aesthetic measure is performance. I consider performance to be best understood by applying a hybrid perspective. Because while we can measure performance pretty precisely, it's really um, in the eye of the beholder. If you, increase, if you improve the speed of a query by 50%, that's not as important as improving a page load time by 50%. So it's really a relative measure. The third aesthetic measure is brevity. This is best understood by applying the eclecticism filter. We instinctively recoil from bloated controllers, from god models with thousands and thousands of lines of code, um, deeply, con deeply nested conditionals, and things like that. I'm reminded of Blaise Pascal's apology. I wrote you a very long letter because I couldn't be bothered. I didn't have enough time to write you a short one. But brevity can negatively affect readability. Readability is absolutely subjective. We write code for humans first and computers second. We write it for a particular audience. Unreadable code can be just as expensive as incorrect code. We use style guides. We use tools like RuboCop to enforce aesthetic principles on the code that we write. We favor short methods. We favor lines of code that are less than 80 characters for those reasons. I think that these four qualities combine in an elusive, mysterious way to create an experience that is aesthetic a sense of what we call elegance. I had a conversation with someone once who said, it's a shame we can't quantify elegance. So I decided to give it a try. This grid maps correctness, performance, concision, and readability onto um, a matrix. So the code that would, that would be profiled in this way is very readable, but not very concise. But it's equally performant and correct. This code is more concise and less readable and an extreme example of that. But 
and um, this one's readable, correct, and performant. But what we aspire to is to maximize the area of the graph and achieve perfect symmetry before the, between these four aesthetic qualities. So why does all this matter? Why does aesthetics matter? Albert Einstein wrote that after a certain level of skills achieved, science and, science and art coalesce into aesthetic plasticity and form, and that the best scientists are also artists. So are we allowing ourselves to be artists? Are we allowing ourselves the freedom to create beautiful code? Think of the modern startup <laughs> culture where a business founder, entrepreneur, comes up with an idea for an application with no sustainable business model and looks for a technical co-founder to make it a reality. And we agree on this MVP, this minimum viable product. The MVP is a contract that we sign in blood if it's not delivered by insert date here, the world will end because there's no Twitter for goldfish. <laughs> what results is brutalist architecture. It's cold, it's rigid, it's ugly, but it's delivered cheaply and, uh, and uh, quickly. This puts the demand for our labor at odds with our aesthetic desires. We want to write cathedrals of code, and they want us to build brutalist structures that have short-term value and have no aesthetic appeal at all. I don't know about you, but I don't want to write code for that devil. So why do I want to write code? Is it for money? Is it for job security? Or is it because I'm attached to the infinite potential of problem solving? Who do we write code for? Do we write it for interpreters, for compilers? Do we write it for stakeholders, for users? I would argue that our, our main audience for the code that we write is other developers. We have to consider the aesthetic sensibilities of the people who are going to come after us, not just our own. We have to be flexible and understand what their needs and desires are as well. Ernie Miller wrote a manifesto called the Humane Development Manifesto. He says, we are humans working with humans to develop software for the benefit of humans. I think this is a very important assertion and one that we keep, should keep in mind as we work to improve our code. So why do we care about quality? What does it matter? Is it a matter of maintainability and extensibility? Or is it more of a matter of the fact that our names are attached to this code? And we don't want someone get blaming us in the future and calling us bad names. <laughs> we care about the quality of our code because our code is an extension of ourselves. Aesthetic appeal is a measure of quality, and I would argue it's one of the most important measures of quality. Not necessarily the stakeholders, but the people who truly own the code, which is us. Architecture without aesthetics is brutalism, and code without aesthetics is a commodity. Maybe some people are comfortable writing crappy code for a big paycheck or if you're working in a startup, options. Um, but we should care about our code. We should respond to its needs and anticipate what they are. We should create a symbiotic relationship with it and guide its evolution even as it guides us. We should consider the experience of writing and reading it. I want to delve into economic theory very briefly, specifically the works of Karl Marx. He created something called the theory of alienation. It describes the estrangement of people from aspects of their humanity as a result of being a mechanistic, me mechanistic part of society. I'm going to read this because it's pretty important. At its heart is the idea that a worker can lose the ability to determine their life and destiny when deprived of the right to think of themselves as the director of their actions, to determine the character of their actions, to define relationships with other people, and to own the things produced by their labor. Workers as an economic entity are directed to goals that are dictated by those who own the means of production in order to extract a maximum amount of value in the course of business. It comes down to a question of ownership. Who owns the product of our labor? Since we're being paid by our employers, they own technically the, the work that we produce. But we need enough autonomy to determine the worth and character of our work and determine its place relative to other people in the community. We increasingly like to think of ourselves as craftsmen or artisans. But if we're just cranking out anonymous code for self-proclaimed entrepreneurs, our code becomes a commodity. And like Marx predicted, we become alienated from the product of our labor. And guess what? Artisans don't work in code factories. We have the power to decide what form our code will take. Code wants to be universal. It wants to be ubiquitous. And it's willing to be flexible to ensure that we stay engaged with it. We can blindly participate in this process like the moths during the Industrial Revolution. Or we can intentionally engage with our code to create experiences of pleasure for ourselves and those who come after. In the end, it's our responsibility to attend to our code orchards and make sure that the fruits of our labor 
are beautiful and enticing and aesthetically pleasing. And that's, I actually came in early, I'm sorry. That's everything I have to say. So I hope I've inspired you to build something beautiful. And I'm open for questions now.